Hi, everybody. Um, I'm Joseph Delpesco, the uh, International Director of Catist. Thank you for coming to the second catch up session with uh, Marina Rosenfeld and Samson Young uh, with a discussion hosted by Philippe Roth. Um, so, we're going to have uh, some, just to kind of keep things moving, we're going to have some of the bios for these wonderful folks um, pasted in the chat area by my colleague Jordan. Um, and just to kind of give you a sense of where we're headed today, um, we'll have short presentations by each of the artists, starting with Marina. Um, it'll be about 10 to 15 minutes and followed by the discussion. Um, and if you have questions or comments along the way, you're welcome to add them to the chat. Um, the catch up session is really a unique opportunity to talk to people across borders and uh, oceans. Uh, we have a really wonderful group here today, Samson in Hong Kong, Marina in New York, and Philippe in Frankfurt. Uh, so that's the unusual time. Thank you for joining us. Um, so I also wanted to quickly mention that this event is being live captioned. Should you prefer or like to have a live caption, you can hit the caption button on the bottom of your Zoom window. And we're also streaming to YouTube. Um, we'll send a link in case you'd like to share it with anyone um, outside of this group who might like to follow along. Um, so I'm going to send um, some images of the exhibition that's um, you know, uh, on view in, in San Francisco at the moment, Seeing Sound, curated by Barbara London. It includes work from Marina and Samson. I um, encourage you to check out uh, the project if you're in San Francisco, um, or maybe tune in online uh, to see some of the images, etc. So um, with that, um, I'll kind of quickly pass it over to Marina to get, get us started here. Hi, everybody. Um, it's um, very exciting to do an artist talk in the morning. I've never done that before, but I know I'm, I've got three hours on um, Joseph and the folks at Cottis in San Francisco. So um, kudos to you <laughs> for getting up really early and uh, to Samson for staying up late. Um, I'm going to screen share and I will do that now. Good, so um, I guess I'm um, uh, just going to talk for about 10 minutes. Um, and I must say that um, uh, it was a double-edged sword to get um, a couple of days ago, a really incredible email from Philippe uh, with a really deep dive into um, just a, a broad and deep um, set of questions about practices, concepts, ideas, histories, overlaps, um, aesthetics, uh, the role that um, sound and music play in my work and in Samson's work. And um, there's no way I can uh, um, go into all of that uh, in 10 minutes. So actually what I'm going to do is just um, situate um, a, a, a little uh, sequence of um, three or four recent shows um, by just scrolling through um, something like the kind of background story of my work that some of you might already know. But um, the uh, history of my work uh, goes back really into the early 90s. Um, so it's been, I've been doing this for a long time now. Um, and these, I was making just large performances, staging large groups of people. Um, I'm just scrolling through a couple of my um, I think I put five images here, um, where I think it would be uh, something I would characterize as a kind of proto-social practice approach to the staging of music. Um, uh, although the kind of lingo around what is referred to as social practice now was certainly not um, commonplace at that time or really um, in really in, in action at all. So um, it was more like 
I um, perceived a kind of um, critical um, intervention around um, the kind of uh, like hyper defended formalism that one encounters coming up through music as opposed to through art, uh, which was my, it, my story. So I'm going to jump ahead. And um, here's an image from Portikus um, in honor of Philippe joining us today. Um, so this now I've gone from the arts uh, and I, would, I think and the teens of the century <laughs> to 2017. Um, and this is a show, um, this show is important because it, in a very um, uh, material way, it's a, the antecedent to the series of works that I'm doing now and that um, are part of the Seeing Sound exhibition at Protest. Um, this show was called Death Star. Um, and it was a, um, an attempt to formalize, if I may use that language, um, the essentially um, dysphoric, dislocated um, experience of listening through, I can only really say my body, female body, local body, a body in space, a body in Germany, uh, visiting there. Um, and it was a recursive structure where sounds were in a kind of continuous state of passing through a device that I built um, based on a kind of historical abandoned research that came out of the experiments in art and technology at Bell Labs in, um, back in the 90s um, that was interested in perception and sightedness and um, kind of the kind of hi-fi, uh, I like that term because it's very 90s, a kind of like hi-fi um, embodied listening that they call perceptual sound field, sound field reconstruction, something like that. Um, but my version was a way to turn the gallery essentially into a kind of machine for composing. So I did that mostly with my voice and there's the device. Uh, you can see it looks uh, quasi-scientific, although uh, the scientists who originally developed that object might not recognize it <laughs> as such, but to me, to me it was. Um, and here's, uh, I'll, I'll move forward to the slide. Uh, part of that project was involved in kind of building a bridge between the work I had been doing, where notation was never a given, but sometimes present and something that I have training in. And um, I developed a notation system for the Death Star show that allowed me to try to transcribe um, uh, overwhelming um, kind of impossible feedback and resonance. So these vertical lines, which kind of have something to do with the architectural and spatial arrangement of the works in the show, also represent um, big spreads of frequencies, essentially. Um, so here's the incredible pianist uh, Marino Fermenti performing one of these pages inside the show. And um, you'll hear that I chose a tiny little clip here that um, uh, he, when he plays a note on the piano, you'll hear the sound blooms and you'll hear quite a bit of sound that is actually not actively being produced by him, but which is part of this kind of extreme feedback loop recursive structure that I built with this object around him. So I'll just play this quite short. So now I'm moving forward a year and a half or so, 
maybe two years ahead. And um, this is the work Music Stands, where again, I'm using the gallery as a space where um, through careful placement of microphones and receivers, or speakers and microphones, which as we know, if you have any experience, even like with your home stereo or the band you used to play in, uh, in close proximity to each other, they begin to communicate and uh, one can kind of tune a system to hover around the edges of a feedback scenario without necessarily um, blowing the place up. Um, so um, here, this is a view of the first exhibition of music stands, um, which was an exhibition at the Artist Institute in New York um, and is currently on view in, in CODIST um, in San Francisco. Um, and again, these are works that stage essentially the kind of state of um, utterance of my voice for the most part. Um, there are kind of um, suggested perceptual um, kind of, I, I, to me, the shapes in these uh, panels, which are UV prints um, on metal panels, um, are like um, proposals to some extent that um, have something to do with the shape of the after sound of these events. So as sounds come out of a speaker and are reflected off of these surfaces, they may torque or they may bend or they may fold. Uh, they may do um, kind of extraordinary, subtle, momentary um, blooming of events. <laughs> so it has something again to do with, I think, a very hyper subjective um, personal experience of sound, which then I'm sort of um, using to model how a system operates, how, how um, signals flow, or like how power, pun intended, um, circulates in a system. Um, here's a view of another work from that series. This is at Codist right now. Um, you'll see in some cases the works um, are configured differently in different shows. So there's something kind of modular about this. So I would say also my work has moved away from site specificity as I may, maybe originally understood it as a kind of necessity to research a space or something like that. I think the works at the moment can kind of circulate uh, in more than one space. Here's another view of that piece configured differently. Other foam elements, there are hard surfaces and absorbent surfaces and all in, to some extent um, having properties that are corporeal that have to do with the um, experience you might also be having as a body in this kind of uncomfortable over amplified or somewhat over amplified space. Um, and then I'm moving forwards again. Here are some views now of my exhibition in Basel at the Kunsthaus Basel, which is up right now um, through the end of September. So as regulations shift, I hope some people will be, <laughs> be able to see it. It's kind of hard to know right now and a really strange time to do a big show. Um, but this is a view of the exhibition, We'll Start a Fire. Um, again, there are sculptures that are often bearing microphones. Um, this is a work on silk textile. Um, the speakers on the wall double as support structures for these kind of um, remnants or traces of these sound effects. There's a view, it's a large show, it's got um, five separate galleries, so that's looking through. There's a one freestanding wall in the show that I'm just absolutely resonating the hell out of. Um, so these are very tiny clips of a very um, 
kind of, it's like taking a little spoon out of a big dish. <laughs> I think there's a second clip here. I'll tell that one as well. These um, uh, I'm not sure, yeah, I, I, it's fun. It's funny having a show that's like active right now. In a way, there's a kind of limit on what I want to say about what's happening there. I want it to speak for itself. And maybe those clips do in a very modest way. Um, uh, but that's what's going on in Basel right now. And we're going to mount a couple of performances in September um, with the cellist Okyang Lee, um, who's one of my most important um, collaborators, as well as Marina and a couple of other people. Um, and um, she is going to bring a cello into the context of this show. And um, the really nice thing is, in a way, I don't. I don't plan to tell her at all what to do. I think she will be in a position with her instrument to move through the space and um, do what she does. So um, there's so I guess I would just point there to a slightly different relationship to this kind of thread about um, composition and improvisation, which are kind of these self mutual graded um, ideas for me in the way that I'm working and how I'm um, kind of offering um, these traces of a kind of um, sonic experience or something like that. The last little uh, short thing I wanted to share today um, is a video um, that um, is called Salute and it's part of a work uh, called Salute and Receiver, which is a video and a sculpture, which is actually going up um, on Saturday um, in a two-person show with myself and um, another artist I really admire, Eileen Quinland at um, Campoli Presti Gallery in Paris. And um, this is the work Salute, and I will just share a minute or two of it and um, say one or two things about it afterwards. Oh, well, I will, I should say, so this was a, a piece made entirely during quarantine inside this, you know, completely disorienting and um, kind of compromised, isolated state of emergency that um, one encountered, you know, in every normal modality of life, there was this, um, as we know, a kind of um, new status to presence, to communication, um, to traveling or not traveling, to, to viewing through the eyes of another. So this was a kind of a really interesting experience where this work was mounted in Dallas, uh, Texas, without my presence at any point, except for uh, like a, almost a year before a quick visit. So even the video was shot and the performances were rehearsed and the experience was offered 
without my um, physical presence at any time. So it, I think that will be clear in the, in the clip. I'll pause it there. It continues around this roof and we drive down again. So it's a kind of endless um, looping structure again. Um, but I would just say this work, um, again, there's a solo performer. In this case, it's the wonderful trumpet player that we found in Dallas, Texas. Her name is Rachel Samayoa. Samayoa and um, just a virtuoso again in her own way. And she was willing to perform this um, short sequence of music over and over again for individual audience who came one by one in cars um, through this uh, installation. And again, I think as in the, work, the, the show in Basel and maybe also going back to the work at Porticus, these pieces that um, inject or sort of like aggressively um, speak into large sound fields where like a, a sound, a voice, a piece of noise, a, a, a salutation by a trumpet player, whatever it may be, a, a, an event on the piano, um, these kind of uh, brutal interjections um, which are then kind of machinically propagated in these sound systems that I've designed where there's lots of feedback chains and echoes and delays and so on. Um, I think the, the um, thing I'm most interested in thinking about is that they produce um, after a space after themselves. They open up a space and I'm interested in that after sound, what that, um, mm -hmm. that is, what the, duration and kind of what kind of opening um, exists there. It's a kind of a rupture in the normative um, fabric of things as I am thinking about it. Um, so like what, where it's like 
that I'm thinking about um, that we have a, moment, a chance to be in the aftermath to some extent of these of, of moments of intensity or brutality in a way, because at least it's in the Basel show, like some of those sounds are quite loud. And there's just, an, you know, there's a moment depending on where you might be in your um, navigation, uh, you might, there are some ear tone moments even where um, your body is really reacting. And then there's quite a bit of empty space to, um, to deal with that. Uh, thank you, Marina. Uh, I thank you, Joseph. Uh, very happy to have uh, the opportunity to speak uh, about what I'm thinking alongside Marina. Uh, I'm a fan of her work for many years. Um, today, I'm going to talk about um, talk about a couple of things I'm thinking about. A couple, of, a couple of books that I'm reading. Uh, they are, uh, I'm thinking about these thoughts in parallel to a project that I'm developing, but they might not end up, uh, they might not all end up in the project. Uh, some of them uh, might make their way into the work. Uh, also, um, some more recent performances um, and experiences that I had about a work that was done a while ago that changed uh, my thinking about the work. So uh, some random nervous uh, thoughts uh, about hearing things. So I've been dealing with um, anxiety issues, uh, 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 supposedly an adjustment disorder. Uh, it makes it difficult for me to have a normal conversation with somebody without thinking that they are like talking about me or attacking me. So I've been reading, um, I've been sort of diving into this uh, big hole uh, uh, of research into hearing things or hearing as a kind of hallucination. Uh, I think about how I hear things uh, productively and creatively. Uh, by that, I mean, I, I sort of make free association uh, and it could be productive, but it also could of course act uh, negatively as a strain on the mind. Uh, so there are sort of two kinds of hallucination. Uh, there, there is the more usual kind, which is what my therapist like telling me about, which is a blurring of uh, perception of facts and feelings. Uh, and there is a whole history of this as a kind of pathology, uh, which I'll talk about in a moment. But this is also a byproduct of an active imagination, which we actually want. So I'm thinking about in a concert, and actually similarly to what Marina was talking about, after a loud sound has happened, and when you're waiting for the long decrescendo to completely disappear, that is really, especially in a concert hall, I think of that as a moment of collective hallucination, because it, the, 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 the sort of physical fact of that vibration um, ceases to exist long after the pianist uh, relaxes, her or his pose. Uh, so, uh, you know, that could also be a productive moment. Um, and there's the other kinds of hearing things as pattern recognition. Uh, so pattern, pattern recognition could act as a kind of preemptive recognition of dangerous patterns. So uh, I, the one example, uh, a kind of fanciful example I found was uh, that uh, there were um, records of bird songs fortune telling in military operation during the autumn and spring period in China. Uh, uh, a kind of a hearing of messages out of otherwise what would be formalistic a uh, surface sonic sound. And of course there is the reverse, right? The Pythagoras curtain, a kind of a charismatic listening that is behind the curtain, but you can do it twice removed. Imagine if you're hearing a foreign language as sonic pattern and therefore uh, ignorant of or unaware of the meaning of the language. That is a kind of listening behind the curtain twice. And is this kind of reduced listening, real listening at all? Um, 
I, I wonder. And then I started uh, going into a bigger and deeper hole of uh, the history of music as a cause of disease. Now, a lot of this uh, 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 research uh, is from James, uh, James Canaway's Bad Vibration. Uh, I, I'm going to do a very quick summary. So around uh, 1800, um, discussion of music uh, and sort of nervousness begin to become related as we begin to think of uh, overstimulation of nerves as a kind of a source of illness, source of sickness. Uh, whereas before, before this time, um, if music had any imagined physical impact on the world, it was more about its association with order and harmony, for example. Uh, and around this time, for example, we had the glass harmonica, Mozart wrote for it, uh, it was seen as a dangerous instrument uh, because when you I mean you play with your fingers and you, you have sensitive fingertips uh, and uh, that was uh, said to have caused uh, illness through the overstimulation of the nerves uh, on the fingertip and then of course this is a continuation uh, of the debate on the role of passion that has been going on since Plato is not new. Uh, around the turn of the century, however, uh, the effects of music uh, uh, and nervousness uh, begin to be associated with uh, modern living, right? Modern life and the pace of it uh, caused uh, nervous uh, nervousness, which was, of course, contrasted with the peace uh, and health and serenity of the countryside. Uh, there's also writings that bundle musical eroticism and overstimulation with homosexuality around this time. And both were also begin to be defined as a kind of medical issue instead of a moral issue. Um, and you begin to get uh, claims about different kinds of music bringing about homosexual tendencies and weakening the mind. And so the, there's also this idea uh, of a healthy rhythm. So uh, mental health was understood as being a question of rhythm, uh, which was uh, quite fascinating. Uh, very quickly jumping to after the Second World War, the anxiety over music's effect on people actually accelerated. Um, and uh, this the notion of musical brainwashing, uh, there's also uh, actually a kind of a revival uh, of medical attention on musical hypnosis. That went on for a while, uh, it didn't last, but this idea actually endured for much longer in popular culture. And uh, for anybody who went to a uh, Christian uh, or Catholic school, you might remember the satanic uh, panic. I was told in Bible class that rock music and heavy metal music embedded uh, reverse messages. And that was a thing that was actually taught to me as a fact. Um, uh, in the 1990s until the present, and this strangely then ended up connecting with something that I was, and I have been interested in, which is the idea of music as a weapon. So we know that the military uh, uses uh, music as a kind of a psychological weapon, especially in torture. Um, and this is a fair uh, thing uh, to be aware uh, and, uh, and uh, vigilant of because the emergence of music technology itself is basically linked to uh, the military, for example. Um, and uh, so now uh, we also have things like the LREP, the long range acoustic device, uh, which uh, is used in policing. So whenever you see a horse in the slide, that's sort of me thinking um, uh, nervous thoughts. And so I was thinking, OK, at this point in the book, Kenaway is making a kind of a jump from music as uh, pathogens to music as a weapon. And there is already quite a bit of a jump there. Is Kenaway implying that we as a society has also overextended the music as a weapon metaphor? But what are the consequences of not reading suspiciously, I wonder. And what are the alternatives if we didn't want to revert to a reactionary neo-formalistic reading of the surface of sound? Uh, so then I jumped to music and consciousness uh, in this book by Daniel C. Denham, many people might have read it, uh, a passage about uh, how music composition competitions are adjudicated. I quote, uh, I find it breathtaking, for instance, that musical uh, composition competitions are held. Uh, the contestants often do not submit tapes or uh, records of their works. They submit written score. And this is absolutely true. I went through 
uh, this. I'm, I'm sure Marina and many other uh, conversation uh, composers also did. Uh, now, how good are the best musical imaginations? Can a trained musician swiftly reading a, a score tell just how that voicing of dissonant oboes and flute over the mastering will sound? And the horse then thought, okay, but there is an element of pleasure in this way of reading as well. Similarly, uh, there is also an intellectual pleasure in what, uh, for example, somebody like Rita Felsky might term a suspicious reading. Both of those are actually fun games to play with the mind. So, uh, i.e., what I guess I'm thinking is that reading is not always goal directed, but yes, in the specific instance described above, it is about winning a competition. Uh, so I did something like surface reading with a Taoist text. I took a classic Taoist text, not this one, but uh, actually the Tao De Jing, and then I took out all of the verbs as an, as an experiment and fed the thing to a Google TensorFlow AI, and out it comes something that you see on the right-hand side. What I found is that uh, the uh, AI is not very good at reproducing legible content. It gets it about maybe 60-70% of the time, but it's very good at reproducing the format, uh, i.e. the way it looks, uh, which uh, to me is, is quite interesting. And so um, uh, uh, I, I've been looking at Taoism because it helps with my anxiety, but then I read this book uh, by uh, J.J. Clark about um, uh, how Taoism uh, is uh, understood uh, and spread uh, to the West. And uh, here I quote, Taoism implies a kind of uh, amoralism. We must uh, ask, therefore, whether Taoism in the modern context could offer a subtle and seductive pathway towards the sort of irrationalist politics which fears critical thinking and seeks to return to an organic unity wherein the individual is lost to the demand of the whole or to the vision of a charismatic leader. That uh, made me not want to uh, go down this path anymore. Uh, and then uh, I uh, something related to Hong Kong, uh, loudness. Uh, so this is an example for quite a while ago, a case of music used as, a, if not weapon, at least for policing. Uh, in 1997, at the handover ceremony uh, of Hong Kong, at the handover uh, celebration party, let's say, there was a protest outside and the police chief, um, uh, Dick Li Ming Wei, he uh, blasted uh, extremely loudly Beethoven's Fifth Symphony uh, uh, through the speakers uh, to uh, uh, let's say pacify or to drown out the voices of protest. And so I was thinking, okay, why but if Beethoven fifth? Uh, am I overthinking uh, this? Maybe it was just loud music um, uh, and, and probably not. And uh, the next thing that I read that is related to this is uh, an introduction written by, uh, written by Christopher Small about mishearing and rehearing, but in the positive sense of the word. Uh, he was pointing out that musical meanings are not permanent and stable, but changeable, with each new context in which the performance takes place uh, changing the musical meaning. Now, the reason why we sometimes imagine that there's a stability of meaning is because uh, scores is inclined to blind us to the fluidity of its meaning, uh, actually. And so, therefore, performing Beethoven's Fifth in our time, meaning uh, Christopher Small's time, not my time, is a different affair from doing it in the composer's own time. Uh, people bring their own history to bear on the performance of a musical text. Uh, here I quote a passage, neither a song nor a style of music can cross us unchanged from one social or cultural group to another. This is not to be called misunderstanding, rather it is creating a new understanding, a re-understanding that keeps the work of creation on the move. Uh, so then the horse is still thinking, is the police chief saying through music fake is not on the door as uh, Hong Kong was handed over. Um, and uh, here's a muted performance of not Beethoven, but Tchaikovsky's Fifth Symphony uh, uh, performed by, uh, a muted version of it performed by the Forest Symphony Orchestra.
quickly, I need to rush through the whole thing because I want to tell you that last weekend, the Hong Kong Symphony had actually performed this piece live. And it was quite different because the, uh, I sense that when uh, I, I did it with members of the Hong Kong Symphony, it was not, let's say, a, a unified project. Uh, and I suspect that they were thinking about something that is quite different to the sort of, uh, let's say, uh, a triumphant, uh, uh, um, let's say, uh, you know, everybody behind the project kind of sentiment that you saw in the Cologne performance, uh, for example. Um, okay, I'm going to totally skip. Uh, let me skip uh, very quickly, fly through all my slides, Joseph. Uh, the horse is still thinking scientific basis for music's effect on the body is generally like in all over the extended. And there seem to be across cultures and history a distrust of individuals' ability to resist music. Uh, and I am going to fly through really quickly the thing that I'm doing now. There's some talents. Uh, or uh, interfaith priest uh, that is trying to derive a, some some kind of a ritual uh, to calm oneself or, or the, the now I don't know. Uh, there's a lot of things going on, and thank you uh, for listening. Thank you, Samson. Sorry to have you rush there. Um, I want to save a little bit of time for the discussion with Philippe. So I'll pass it over to you, Philippe. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> thank you both Marina and uh, Samson for this uh, incredibly rich uh, presentation and yeah certainly also in Samson's case we have so much material there that we could delve deeper into but I'm try I'm going to try to ask a couple of questions that would uh, involve both of you that would uh, address both of your practices though at very first sight uh, they seem extremely different. Um, I had the chance to work with Marina a couple of times, the privilege uh, to work with her. I have not yet the chance to work with Samson, and I hope to do so uh, somewhere in the future, if possible. One of the main questions, I, I guess, and it brings it back to a, a maybe a more mundane uh, um, place, is you both are um, extremely accomplished musicians and composers. And notwithstanding that, you both chose for a domain, the world of art, art spaces, art, uh, the art realm, the art institutions, um, or art world produced um, projects, uh, instead of, let's say, the world of music. And Marina also hinted at that already, um, very briefly, um, that uh, it was also critical for against a hyper formalism of the musical realm, a, a kind of maybe a codified world. And I guess uh, Samson also, when you see where he wants to go um, with a, a kind of like the research towards a new project, I guess, it's also like uh, where can we, and if you also take into account the mute of Tchaikovsky, where can we go outside of that um, um, world of, let's say, the institutional world of music, even if it might still happen there. So maybe, I don't know, um, if Samson want to start um, to, yeah, why the world of art? Because there's maybe one last thing also in, in galleries and in also what I've seen in the photographs of Marina or when we work together, those acoustics are not the same, for example, as in the world of music. So maybe yeah. Yeah, uh, uh, thank you for the question. I, I mean, I mentioned uh, briefly, um, but maybe too quickly uh, in the presentation that I think um, there are sites where musical or venues where musical meanings seem to be more settled uh, and spaces of contemporary art to me seem a little more open to these conversations. Uh, so that's, uh, you know, one of the reasons. And, and the other is, to be honest, is also just that I really enjoy making in both time-based and non-time-based medium and actually usually combine. So, uh, you know, I make hooks and videos and animation, but also music uh, and, you know, these 3D printed objects and drawings. So it's not as easy to combine all of these interests um, in a concert space or a theater space. And, but you're right, what you give up, uh, what you give up up is uh, good acoustic, but also it's not uh, very interesting to try to recreate that sort of precious acoustic condition in a, in a, a less concert-like space, I guess. Um, in my case, I would, am I muted? No. Um, I would say, I mean, in many ways, this is a political question. 
This speaks, this is a question about um, sites of cultural production and what the codes in those sites are, as Samson has also commented. Um, in my own case, uh, I, I don't, um, I don't see my work with sculpture materials or static forms or spatial arrangements outside of the lens necessarily of music composition. I, th these are very powerful um, kind of modalities of thought for me, the way a painter might think about drawing um, in making an arrangement in space. I am thinking about composition and I'm thinking about um, the politics in a very um, acute way often of um, the exchange between bodies of formalized sound. So I don't, I don't see, and, and then just to add to that, I, I'm also um, active, uh, like when I'm, when in the Death Star project, which I did at Porticus with you, um, the really amazing opportunity that I had at that particular year was to do that exhibition and then to create Death Star orchestration, which was an orchestral concerto format version of this exhibition on a concert stage in like a German music festival with like German music aficionados as an audience instead of an art audience. And in that sense, I, I was, I encountered a lot of pushback as a visual person, like what was I doing in there? domain, you know, and like small um, kind of violations of protocol that I unwittingly committed. This is something I understood later, produced like a lot of pushback from musicians. <laughs> mm -hmm. It seems that you both work, in fact, um, when, when we don't look at the context, but at the way of working, which then influences different contexts, um, that it's kind of like a, a the output is a heterotopia of music that there is like uh, it of sound music sound um maybe the 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 general thinking is around sound and music but then there is like visualizations there is recordings there is re-recordings there is um very specific uh, directions towards uh, the recognition of space and also how to direct certain spaces etc um, there is so many different manifestations that are as if the you have a hot bed and and it kind of like uh, hypostasizes in in many many different uh, so that's that's probably a, a way of working and see what could be let's say the manifestation of a certain train of thought um, in in these different kind of ways be it graphic or visual or if you i don't know maybe i implied already too much in the question well i know i think that's I, if i understand what you're pointing to um you know it is certainly true and i that um you know uh like the kittler um the friedrich kittler quotation in samson's presentation now was was apt in the sense that you know when we're dealing with the accoutrements of a kind of a system um that system is inevitably modeling the power structures and ideologies um, that produced it. You know, so if if it's true that amplification itself is a tool of war, uh, then to address amplification even in a kind of fractally smaller domain, say in a room, um, by extension, I think you are speaking about what produced this phenomenon and you give maybe yourself a chance to kind of vibrate with the outcomes of these processes that otherwise are like essentially inflicted on us. Um, I was, I had, I was curious in Samson's um, talk just now, um, you, I, I personally never had the experience of like comp being a composer on that that like level that perhaps you did where where I would submit a composition to a competition. So I actually don't have that experience. But how do you think now about the sort of possibilities for you of this like historical idea of, of composing? Yeah, I I mean I still write. Um, 
I still write music, but I uh, have much more fun writing for smaller groups of friends. I mean, um, the, the, the Sinfonietta is a great ensemble, but every time I uh, work with an orchestra, I, I do feel a bit small. I mean, I, I, don't, I don't need to be big. I just don't like to be, a, I like to be normal size, uh, let's say, when, when working with, a, with an ensemble. And, uh, uh, and so, yeah, so I, I agree with you um, uh, about these, um, about replication of structures um, in these different uh, spaces that, that that we work with, but I guess uh, also um, I'm, uh, time is a factor. Time mean, meaning that uh, to put, you know, when when you are making something in a concert hall or even a the, in a theater space, uh, within reason, uh, you you kind of do subject everything to a timeline, uh, even though you are you you could be working against it, but but there is a kind of a timeline that that uh, um, uh, at least as a kind of a, a basis. So that is also something you, you are working against. Uh, and outside of a timeline, uh, I, I feel like with my way of thinking, which is much more messy, much more like a mind map than making an argument, uh, I, I, I feel a little more free uh, and intuitive when I'm working um uh in a space where these different ways of working are at, uh, all sort of uh, more possible i would maybe like to jump in on that and ask something about the importance of the score for both of you and 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 with with your presentation samson had maybe the wrong impression but it could be as if it was an embryonical uh, beginning of a score to a new project, you know, your readings, your comments on the readings. And, and you see that in, in both cases, both for Marina and Samson, the score has um, uh, a, a kind of like a, a mobilizing function, a driving function, but also it becomes a, uh, a materialized uh, object to look at or to, uh, to be presented or to, to show. Um, yeah, maybe, I don't know, maybe first Samson, um, whether this makes sense that this is kind of already like the beginning of making a score. Yeah, um, well, I, I, uh, it's interesting. I, I didn't think of like making, like a let's say like a knowledge mind map as a kind of a score maybe maybe it is but i guess in general my interest in score uh, it's um i'm interested in uh, musical notation in general that are sort of highly visual so uh i, I mean the, the the usual example are the graphical scores like people like kaju and george lewis and crumb and, and etc but also uh, what i mean is highly visual in a sense that they contain a uh, score and like these scores contain additional visual or textual information that are almost like residual in a sense that they are not necessarily functional by functional i mean of course they you know they do not prescribe a musical response they help it they could be uh they, they could be sort of um inspire uh, inspiring uh sort of musical responses but they're not directly instructing musical responses so i, I think these visual elements they oscillate between sort of working with a system of, co of signs that is designed according to the logic of the ear, um, but also broadening it to embody the way people sort of visually perceive energies in music. So I'm interested in, in that, um, like the leftovers, let's say. Um, uh, and uh, there's also pleasure in it, right? So the visual element and the score uh, are also moments when I think the composer or the person making it is just sort of enjoying the pleasure of penmanship and uh, having a bit of fun. So uh, that, I mean, that's sort of why I, 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 I am interested and why I'm drawn to uh, visual scores. But, but when I make scores, I, I don't really, uh, I mean, I do make uh, graphical scores uh, for musicians as well. I sometimes write things out, sometimes I make graphical scores. It really depends on the piece, but a lot of the drawings that I make are actually the reverse. They are sort of, they are transcriptions. So they are about kind of uh, Every time encountering uh, when I'm encounter uh, when I'm encountering a new sonic environment, trying to uh, depending on what environment I'm in, uh, inventing a kind of idiosyncratic um, grid 
So not using, uh, not necessarily using like like let's say a scientific way of uh, making these marks to uh, uh, record the pitch or, or whatnot. Not not like a, not like a record, but more like a sort of making up system uh, on uh, in on the fly. Yeah, well, I was maybe uh, to also bring it to Marina, but I was interested in in this moment that Samsung also brought about this kind of like that the score is blind to um, an ideological interpretation. And I'm really, really interested in this kind of like dialectic between score and uh, what that really happens in the idiosyncratic way, like, which is very different from, let's say, other forms of more visual art where the material uh, element is, is kind of like, uh, can cannot be a, an interpretation in a certain sense. You know, this is, very interesting that in, in music and sound art, there is this constant dialectic with the what ought to be that is in the score and what is in the end in uh, an, an interpretation. And it's also like this fascinating element that certain songs have been used and misused, what Samson hinted at, uh, hinted at sorry, um, by different ideological regimes, you know, like, uh, and, and, and also this whole, yeah, Maybe also Marina can react to this. This uh, the ideal of the yeah. score versus the the messiness of the other thing. Historically, like pre twentieth century, the score is uh, you know in the common practice period, like it, the score is obviously like a like an idealized version. It participates in the whole kind of mythologizing of the composer as the genius at the top of a hierarchy. If you know, then you have like a kind of small band of permitted interpretation and then reception by the passive listener. Um, but, you know, by the post-war period um, with graphic notation and other kinds of experimentalisms, you begin to see um, a kind of destabilization or dislodging of the score as the kind of the highest document. So to me, I'm looking at this at notations or scores as um, a kind of mediating location between two bodies, two peoples, two intelligences or multiples, let's say, but that it's a power relation. You could really describe it as an erotic relation to a great extent because it's very much about giving instruction and also giving power or relinquishing power. And that um, power relation between the one who makes the sound and the one who committed a mark to a paper is very, um, unstable and the really interesting scores actually like intervene into like what that is, what that erotic bond is. And, you know, like that, I use that language only to, to kind of round out it. I don't mean power exclusively in a kind of administrative sense, but in the more exciting sense or the more troubling sense. So for me, notation is like, um, a tool that might be relevant, um, but it's also a training that I have, and it's an, it's like a it's a um, it's a language. It's like a language that gives us um, a whole other way of um, articulating relational uh, bonds or something. It's to me, that's really where it stays really interesting. It brings me to another uh, reflection I had of both of your work, which is about embodiment or embodied, and uh, em not embodied, yeah, also embodied knowledge, but embodiment of um, an interpretation, um, which is kind of like the whole power relations that you both hinted at in music, like music can uh, bring together or divide, you know, it can be an element of warfare, but it can also be, and I think here also, Marina, at your uh, massive performances with lots of people that in fact instead of and also in at Tchaikov, the Tchaikovsky muted Tchaikovsky piece of Samson where the whole idea that these different people would disappear behind a bigger kind of like expression is kind of like deconstructed and that you both think a lot about uh 
the embodiment and who are the performers and who are with Marina working with specific age groups or teenagers in certain works or with military and other works. And also, I was wondering in Samson's case, um, how important it was for him when he uh, made the Jutta Tchaikovsky, the background of the, of the interpreters. So is, how, how much did he think about which people were the interpreters? Maybe Samson, you could start. Um, yeah, um, the, well, there are a couple of questions in there. I mean, the, the short answer uh, is that um, I'm I'm not sure. Like, I, there, there are no there are no um, uh, when when I approach uh, working with people, I'm often unsure of this. And then as pieces get performed by other people, I learn more. And then I'm like, oh, maybe I shouldn't have done this. You know, it, it's always, I'm always reconsidering. Uh, but specifically about Tchaikovsky fifth, uh, I think the uh, cultural background is quite important and timing is also important. And this is something that I guess I knew, uh, but uh, became more apparent um, when uh, the Sinfonietta, Hong Kong Sinfonietta performed. Uh, performed the last weekend. I mean, in the Cologne version, uh, the conversation with the musicians, for example, let, let me talk about these technical specific, but, but there's a point. Like the, the conversation with the musicians were mostly technical. We were focusing on, okay, how do we mute this sound? And they were trying to mute it good. Like they were trying to do a good, beautiful muted sound. And they, they were, uh, I, I would say they were by and large quite behind the project. And also we, we had a long time to prepare for, for it together. So we developed a report, let's say. So they didn't feel like I was going in and like I, I was trying to, um, um, they, 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 um, they I, I guess that there was a, a kind of a relationship uh, that, that was productive. And so that was 2018 in Germany. Uh, and then in Hong Kong in 2021, the piece, maybe only in my mind, uh, became more about the aggression of the act of muting itself. And that really, I think, came from the environment. I mean, in a way, I'm quite, the, I'm quite like twice detached in the piece, from the piece in a way that is maybe a little irresponsible even. But when I, the piece gets realized in these different situations, I think these things come to the fore. I mean, personally, I sense that uh, there were some musicians who were uh, uncomfortable comfortable with the idea of being muted. Uh, I could be imagining things, but it was not the same sort of relationship. And so for Hong Kong in 2021, uh, Tchaikovsky and the classical canon that it represented wasn't really just about, for example, middle class comfort. You know, it, it may be more about quote unquote, the goodness of music, which while it is an idea that has been really thoroughly intellectually deconstructed in the West, takes on quite a different tone in 2021 in Hong Kong. So I, I think this is something that I learn about only when I do the thing with different people. Uh, so the, the, situ uh, the situation itself um, uh, allows these different uh, meanings to, to surface and th that I learned from. Right, Philippe, maybe I can jump in here for a moment. I think we're about 10 minutes over and really want to been enjoying the conversation so much I hate to uh, break it up. But I just want to take a minute to thank ICI International uh, who organized Seeing Sound and, and really kind of created the occasion with Barbara London, the curator, to bring these artists into our world. And we're so grateful to her and to them. Um, and very, very grateful to Philippe, who's an advisor of CADIST and, you know, a good friend and um, we're really happy to have you with us today leading this conversation. Um, and finally to Marina and Samson, um, wish we could talk for hours more. Um, thank you all so, so much for joining us today. Um, the entirety will be on YouTube uh, in an edited version. Um, and we'll uh, hope to continue the conversation in person at some, some point.